also happy Ramanjan birthday. Uh, as uh, the title indicates, I'm going to speak about the Lindelof class. And this is joint work with Anup You've heard already in uh, several of the talks in the morning about this class of L functions that have been defined by Selberg. And the detailed definition is not really necessary, and perhaps I know perhaps you did already in this slide. But the detailed definition for us is not so necessary. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, this class, which I will denote S, blackboard bold S. It consists of functions F uh, satisfying five properties, which really are like this. A is that it has a Dirichlet series expression. In other words, it is a Dirichlet series absolutely convergent for the real part of S to the one. It has uh, analytic continuation. Uh, as a function of order one. Um, I don't need to say that. Analytic continuation. Uh, only possible for one. So strictly speaking, if I want to say this correctly, it should be meromorphic continuation. It's the only possible pole that S equals 1. Uh, C is that it has a functional equation. D is that it has Euler product. And e, I don't know if you can see this far low, but it satisfies the Ramanujan hypothesis. And uh, the idea if of uh, considering this class is to try to model the kind of L functions that we are used to seeing uh, that arise either from algebraic geometry or numbers. Now, by no means does it exhaust all uh, quote unquote unnatural L functions that arise in mathematics. For example, uh, spectral uh, data functions aren't captured by this. Uh, also, if you were, uh, if you were to take um, a translate of a familiar L function. It's not going to be captured by this. And in fact, it was that latter thing, I think, that was motivating Selberg. Uh, um, Anup spoke about C values. I'm not sure why you changed C, why you chose C, but uh, uh, Selberg actually talks about A values. <laughs> but in fact, they are the same, A equals C. Um, and he wanted to know, you know, study zeros of the Riemann data function. You can as well study how often it takes a value A. And what's the distribution of that? And when you study such things, you are naturally led to study linear combinations. Familiar functions. And when you do that, when you do that, uh, you are thrown out of it. Out of that. now dealing with uh, a function which uh, has some of these properties, but by no means all of them. And nevertheless, it's an interesting function that you want to study. As I said, Selberg was looking at A values. I will tell you one other instance in which uh, uh, this kind of situation arises, and there's many situations, but I'll tell you one where, uh, if I want to advertise our work, uh, I'll tell you one situation where it arises in the following way. Here's an example. If I take K as an imaginary quadratic field, You look at the uh, class group. Okay. Now you can look at uh, various characters. This is a finite abelian group, of course. And you can look at characters of this group. Uh, 
characters, complex characters. And you associate it to that, you can make um, a function. Um, as HECA, the HECA L functions or char these are characters of finite order, of course, but these are finite group. And as you vary over all such characters, let's call the set of such characters X, uh, there's a natural action of complex conjugation on the set of characters. And if you look at uh, a set of o uh, um, orbit representatives for complex conjugation, you get you get a certain number of characters phi, and then here is a, a, a result. Um, Um, this is the result. Years ago, what it says is that the, the values L1 chi over chi as uh, chi varies over the uh, representative. So X, uh, to find some, uh, how do I, X modulus conjugation. Uh, these are two body. And to do this, so this is a thing, this is an interesting statement about linear independence of special values, normalized special values of L functions. This is still transcendental. Uh, and to do this, to prove this, one considers uh, Dirichlet series, which we might call LFF. F is some linear combination. Of these chi, so immediately you again another instance where you are thrown out of the cell group. And there are many other situations where uh, you have interesting problems that cannot be solved by, by staying within the cell group. So then the issue is that uh, whether there is a bigger class. <coughs> Is there a larger class um, in which one has a ring structure? Of course, if you take two elements in the sober class, you're still you're still in there. So it's a semigroup. This is a semigroup. And one could say, well, the, the kind of obvious answer to this kind of question is to take the semigroup ring. Over the complex numbers. That's a ring. So the natural candidate. But we are going to actually take something, we will actually consider a bigger class. Which is eventually we will call the Lindelof class, but I'll get to this. And the reason for looking at this larger class is that we start from the other, other way. That is, this, if you were to take this, it's like uh, you've already fed into it the things that you're used to seeing in an L function and then think how much bigger I need to make it to get it to a ring. The other approach for us is to take, just start with the Dirichlet series, which is an analytic continuation, and then to work back, uh, try to cut it down to a place where I can prove interesting theorems. So this is something I, I thought about some years ago, but then recently with, with Anup, we were able to make Okay. Nevertheless, it's clear, and I hope it probably will be clear, 
but we are we are just starting to study this ring, and there's lots to be uh, understood about it, about this problem. Okay. So now we will first start defining class T. And again, I'm going to state the properties, unless I really need to, I'm going to state properties generally, because you don't need to know the exact details. Prove something. So T will consist of functions which have Dirichlet series expression. And uh, maybe it's important to say I want it to be absolutely convergent. B it has uh, analytic continuation. So this means again like this that S minus one to the K that the S uh, can be continued as an entire function order one. Notice in the Selbrook class we didn't need to say anything about finite order or anything like that. It's forced on you. That order one is forced on you. Here we will have to say that it is actually order one and see that Raman is an actor. The, the order of being finite and order one comes from uh, existence of finite functional equation and the precise form of the function. Notice, for example, the Selberg zeta function also has a function. It's a function of order two. The fact, the point of course is in this case, in Selberg's case, in the Selberg class rather, uh, the gamma factors are classical gamma. Factors. Okay, so now for such an element, we define mu f, the function mu f. Let's assume, suppose f uh, in class is entire. That is, the moment, and suppose I'm taking an element where k is 0. So there's no pole that is equal to 1. Okay, so we define mu f uh, of sigma to be the following. In t moment, Lambda equal to zero is the property that f on the lambda on the sigma line bounded, possibly with a constant depending on the on f of mod sigma. Okay, so on the on the sigma line, it grows roughly like sigma to the or t to the lambda. And if there isn't any such lambda. And you also define mu f star sigma. It's similar in all this, except here in this estimate, we allow constant depend both on f and on sigma. Here, I could I could have suppressed the sigma because the answer is constant. Okay. So I have. You have a function for each f in t. You have this mu f of sigma. It could be, and this was defined for entire elements. And if if I have something which is not entire, if f have as a pole, <coughs> you consider the function that you get by killing the pole. As a zero, this one. Notice I do it like this rather than s minus one to the k because this is a Dirichlet series. So I still stay in the context. Which have a Dirichlet series expansion. Then uh, this thing is entire, and uh, we define mu uh, uh, f this one which has a pole. Similarly, mu f. Okay, so 
So therefore, you have a you have this defined now for all elements of um, this class. This uh, kind of growth condition and even the notation is should be reminiscent of the function which comes about by application of Stardman Rindelof. That's the reason for calling it. Okay, so some remarks. Uh, so first is that mu f star sigma is zero if sigma is greater than one. That's because we're we're given a function which is defined by an absolutely convergent state space series to the right of one, and therefore we can put up sigma is zero. Uh, you cannot conclude at this point that mu f of sigma is zero for sigma to be one. Second. As an example, if f is a constant function, is there is there an example where mu f of sigma is not zero and mu f star is zero? We'll come to that. Uh, if f is a constant in the sense the first definition, mu f of sigma depends on sigma? Mu um, f is a function of sigma, yes. but this implicit constant doesn't depend on sigma. Ah, okay. So if f is a constant function, uh, in words, by the way, I can tell you what's going on here. Uh, this allows you, and we'll see by an example, this uh, allows you to not worry about what's happening near the real line. So if the function is doing something nasty near the real line, you can pull it into the function. I understand. But, uh, but in the first definition, if sigma is fixed, if I want to compute mu f of sigma, what does it mean then that uh, 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 inequality does not depend on sigma? Um, so dependence on sigma is shoved into the power of lambda. I think that's what you mean, right? Um, no, no. I, I, like I wanted a constant like uh, 10. It doesn't depend no matter which sigma I choose. I will get some, uh, I have some constant. Hmm? Um, lambda, of course, will depend on sigma, yes. You're not happy. So we'll, you'll see examples. Uh, if I was just supposed to say if f is a constant function, which, by the way, uh, in the Selberg class means it's 1. But in this T, of course, we've got all constant functions in this set. So if there's a constant function, then both of these are zero. Um, three, um, this mu f star, whatever it is, it's less than or equal to mu f. And four, if my f happened to be in the Selber class, then mu f of sigma, I can bound it. Third is opposite to, right? Third is opposite, no? Um, no. Yeah. So here, uh, you, you know, all the levels, no? Mu f then. Yeah, yeah, no, the point is I'm allowing the constant to depend on sigma. So if it works with them, without any dependence, it will only work with them. Oh, I see. Then also you are taking the infimum of all the lambda. Okay. 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 Okay
we'll define a sub subset of T we call M. So these are the elements of F in T with the property that mu F of sigma over 1 minus 2 sigma is bounded. Okay, and you see by, by this thing that the server class is contained. Now, uh, now for if I have an element f in this inside this m, I will define. I think what Anup did define already. The, the c, right? We did uh, c sub f to be lim su two sigma over one minus two sigma. Here star will be the same thing with. So, so now with this uh, with this class, which doesn't have any hypothesis about whether product or functional equation, we have a, we have defined numbers c sub f and c sub f star. These play the role of degree. And by using uh, fragment Lindelof, we see that uh, mu f of sigma, you get an analog of this one. Mu f of sigma is less than or equal to one half c sub f and minus sigma. Same thing with. So we've set up this uh, this set M, and uh, M is the one we're going to study. Uh, and after inverting some elements, it's going to result in something called the Lindelof. Let's look at this M. If I take uh, any, if I take for example the Riemann zeta function, then the C for it, or the star, is also one. And in fact, if I take an element f in the Selber class, then the C f is the same as C star f as a degree. Okay, so this is a generalization of the concept of degree um, from the Selber class. Six, six point is the example you're asking about. Suppose I consider the function okay, the solution. So this converges for all that. And what we'll find is that mu f star sigma is zero. So it's bounded. Any sigma you take, it's bounded possibly with a constant depending on sigma. And so therefore, c f star is zero. <coughs> However, um, CF is one for the following reason.
if you consider um, f at minus k, that is summation e to the minus n into k, which is simply like uh, integral e to the minus t, t to the k, which is um, k plus one. And so this is going to grow like k to the k minus a half. And therefore, if you look at what is our uh, uh, mu f, minus k, it's going to be, it's going to be k minus a half. And therefore, the cf is going to be equal to 2 mu f of minus k over 1 plus 2k, which is uh, 2k minus 1, or 2k plus 1. So is this difference now in the above, like difference between CF and C, sorry? Yeah, this is exactly the point. That you see what's happening is, uh, it, all the bad stuff is happening near the uh, real axis. And these two things are just captured. Okay, so therefore, the CF uh, sees the whole line, everything, even what's happening here. Whereas CF star doesn't care about what is only worries about what's happening for large C. So therefore, you have in this case an example where CF star is zero, but CF is one. And moreover, using this example, you can make lots more examples. You see there is a simple proposition proposition is that this, these things the numbers multiply. So C F G uh, is C F C G and C star F G is C star F G star, and so uh, you take this example and multiply it. You take some power of f, this f, and some power of zeta. Then what happens is uh, c star, let's call this g, c star of g. Uh, this is uh, zero, and you're just going to get m. But c um, g is going to be R. You can make them spread out as much as Okay, now time is going uh, really fast. I think I spent 10 minutes, right? So, so then let me quickly, at least uh, before the end of the talk, define the, the Lindelof class. Um, there are seven. Okay, number eight. Comment number eight then is that I can make more examples where the C of star is zero. If F is a Dirichlet polynomial, then necessarily C of star is zero. And in fact, one has the following proposition. If CF star is zero, it can only be if um, F is Dirichlet series. Maybe I need to multiply by some power of to allow for force. Okay, so this these don't don't exist in the Selberg class. In the Selberg class, 
uh, these are state series that convert for all s don't exist. I mean, it's just a constant. And so this is a, 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 a set of uh, subspace that you have to deal with in this bigger class. So we might call these sort of null elements. F in M. And what we're going to do to um, just make a remark. Yes. So what we're going to do is we're going to invert them. We're going to um, so we're going to define the Lindelof class as follows. Let's call this thing here. Let's call this set uh, M0. Okay. M0 star. And then uh, we take the non-zero elements. Zero star. And zero star. And zero. And the Lindelof class will be uh, just invert these other elements. Now um, there is uh, an ultimate now we, we want to extend we can extend the definition C function to L star. Namely, if you write uh, an element as uh, some f over nu, the nu is uh, in M0 star, non-zero element is equal to zero. Then you define the C, the G of this, then you define Cg to be Cf. And you can check that this is well defined. The units, so this is L star, is the ring, and the units are exactly things you've inverted, the elements. Now one can ask what kind of ring we've created here. Unfortunately, it seems to be a very big ring, too big. And it's a little bit disappointing to realize that it's not Mercerian. Well, uh, so what, what we know is that uh, the green M is neither Mercerian nor And we expect the same, expect this to be true as well. Um, and uh, we note the following fact, which is pretty interesting, I think, namely that uh, if Selberg's orthonormal ortho Analytic conjecture with an analytic conjecture. Two. Then this group ring that we could have taken over the semi group ring over the Selberg class is also not nothing. These conjectures are saying that uh, Selberg introduced the notion of a primitive element in the Selberg class, and then he said that two distinct primitive elements are uh, or, or, or orthogonal, I guess, in the sense that uh, if you take the uh, AF of T, A, V of P bar over T, this should be uh, bounded. This should be bounded. Yeah. G.
consequence of this, the conjecture, I think you showed this, the unique factorization of any element in the Selberg class in two primitive elements. And using that, one can show that uh, this is in fact this single concentration. So these are big rings. Now, uh, so what, what we should be looking for, so the last five, four minutes, let me speculate, but what we should be looking for, uh, what we want is a natural way to decrease the size. These rings are too big. Now you may ask uh, why we're so interested in these rings these things to start with. I, I motivated it a little bit at the beginning in terms of functions, problems that arise in analytic number theory that should involve linear combinations of our functions. But you see, more generally, there are other problems which uh, are sort of in the uh, folklore and for which we don't even have a proper formulation. Questions such as, for example, uh, do L functions deform? Do they live in a family? You know, is, it, is it possible to make a, a family of L functions? Not in the sense that uh, people speak of families nowadays in terms of their monodromy, but in terms of really is there a one parameter continuously varying family of L functions? We don't expect that to be true. We expect that uh, somehow um, these things are discrete. There is a trivial way to make a family, namely take, um, I guess we take something in the Selberg class, of that and then look at f of s plus it, but then I think you destroy the, you destroy something, right? Destroy the functional equation. Yeah, functional equation. So, um, so there is, uh, we don't expect a continuous family, but, but, um, but the question is, how are we going to be able to prove that? Well, one way is if you look to other fields where people look at the deformations of structures, uh, it is by, trying to create a, a geometry of the underlying space. And so if we had a good ring, we could think that we could try to, you know, we might be able to do a little bit geometry on that ring of L function. And then, uh, then I, I sort of view the Lindelof class as, as or some variation of it, or some smaller version of it, as being some kind of tangent space to L function. So that, which will be then be of importance in, in solving the formal Okay, so there's some uh, vague general thinking behind this, but that's, that's why we're going, going through it. Uh, on this point about uh, the comment you just made, uh, there are many operations on M that are not allowed. One, of course, is um, adding. But then there are other things you can do, which are sort of key to proving these, these ring theoretic statements. Um, what you can do is you, um, you can take, if I have a class an element in M, then I can add a constant that's still in M. Or if I have a, an element in M, I can look at F1, which is, F times some constant times F. It's still in it. Or another operation you can do is um, uh, you can also look at F plus A. These are operations that aren't allowed in the algebra class, but they are allowed in M. And by doing these kind of operations is how you prove that these, uh, these statements about the uh, Okay, I think I'm out of time. Build a ring that would include, well, we surely can, but with good properties uh, that could include logarithmic derivatives of L functions. Yeah, and so maybe linear combinations of them. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. The problem of course, then they're, they're miromorphic. And so we, we have to, that would be the next step to be able to include uh, singular, more infinitely many singularities, and then how to keep them under control. Yeah, that's certainly a good idea. Another question? It's not big time to speak